Hello, good morning, and good morning. welcome. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, why would I want to come to Aspen? I don't know. <laughs> um, I am uh, excited. I am so excited to be here this morning um, to talk about holding the line on global women's health. And why would we have to hold the line on global women's health? Um, because there's a war on women's health still. It's happening in the United States, and it's happening internationally. Um, the health of women and girls is very closely tied to their success. It's to their sexuality, their marriages, um, their childbearing, and the U.S. is grossly stepping back leadership in this area. For the first time, the State Department has eliminated detailed information about contraception and maternal health care in its annual country reports on human rights. And the current administration has reinstated and broadened the so-called gag rule, something we're going to talk a lot about today, which prohibits foreign aid from going to any organization that discusses abortion as part of its family planning activities. This has impacts globally that we are only starting to understand and see. And it is such an honor to introduce three groundbreaking leaders in this space who have been working on the front lines even before the Trump administration, <laughs> um, but <laughs> have ramped up their efforts. Um, to my right is Francoise, Francoise Girard. Um, she's the president of the International Women's Health Coalition and an advocate for women's rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights. To her right is Thlaleng Mofokeng. She's the vice chairperson of the Sexual and Reproductive Justice Coalition in South Africa, but that's only one of her jobs. She is also a general practitioner with a focus on sexual and reproductive health, and she is a tremendous and emerging voice in the space globally. To her right is Lu uh, Louise Kwam, and she's the CEO of Pathfinder International, positioning the nonprofit to continue its leadership on sexual and reproductive health and rights in a rapidly changing world. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. So let's just start at the beginning. It's 2018. We have Beyonce. <laughs> 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 Women ostensibly can do whatever they want if they want to. Mm. Why are we still having this conversation? Well, there's, um, there's a faction of people who have a different worldview. And they are extreme conservatives, often rooted in evangelical or Catholic thinking in this country, but abroad as well. And the view is based on the notion that women's destiny is rooted in their biology, and that women's uh, role in society should be defined by their reproductive function, and, and only that. And therefore, women should uh, perform their roles as caregivers and nothing else, and be subordinate to men. Men should be the leaders, the political uh, heads of countries, uh, the heads of households, and so on. That sounds extreme, but this is actually the worldview that Vice President Mike Pence espouses, and that uh, many of the cabinet members in the Trump administration espouse. And in fact, uh, you know, we at the International Women's Health Coalition looked at the profile of the cabinet members as they were being nominated and appointed, and almost all of them are anti-abortion, anti-reproductive rights, and anti-LGBT rights. So that is the worldview that is uh, governing this war on women. Because if you control women's bodies, their reproduction, their sexuality, you control their lives. Mm. Yeah. What, what do you, yeah. yeah. And I think for, I mean, black women in, in Africa, specifically in South Africa, um, I think people d d struggle to connect what's happening at the Senate, in the House of Representatives, and just globally on women's health and then politics to what then happens on the ground. Um, because there's a lot of um, work that obviously happens within administrations. A Republican come in, a Democrat comes in, and the Democrats always say, no, 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 you can do whatever you need to do with our foreign aid, and the Republicans say, no, no, you actually can't. Mm. And so for us on the ground, this means that you can't really have sustainability of any program because you never know some of this critical funding, if it's coming or not coming. Um, and because for us, specifically in South Africa, we've got the historical memory of the second Bush mm. presidency, where because of the HIV response, everything became about PEPFA and USAID, and they managed to disintegrate reproductive justice and reproductive health, and made the issue about HIV only. Um, and that really, we've never really recovered as a health system, but also as a civil society, because it hampers our ability to advocate 
to give information to patients, which means already as a medical doctor, I can't, uh, that interferes with my patient and doctor relationships in terms of giving evidence-based care, giving the information that the patient may not even request but needs to know about. Um, and so there's a definite translation mm -hmm. into what happens into people's lives. And I think what I would hope everyone gets to understand here today is that this money, this foreign aid, is being done on your behalf. When this money arrives, it says it's coming on behalf of the American people. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is this what you intend? And again, as someone who's been working in civil society before uh, um, uh, Trump and Obama, actually, mm -hmm. is that we didn't see this global response. And I think it's really, again, because of the domestic <coughs> attacks mm -hmm. on women's rights, the fact that you couldn't now um, you know, get contraception, your, your company couldn't offer that for you, your health care aid was being restricted, and that really then energized the bigger, the bigger struggle. But I think for us in South Africa, as black women, as people in the African continent, we've been feeling unheard. We've always had a voice, but no one was just listening to us. And mm. I think maybe what this has done for all of us is to connect us more, to really realize that no matter where we are in the world, if you are a woman, you are a person with a uterus who can fall pregnant, you are already marginalized. And the fact that you are in the first world, I'm in the third world, mm. suddenly it doesn't matter anymore. Mm. Um, and so that's, I think, the main thing for me today. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. If we could do one thing in the world to make the most difference on peace and sustainability, on advancing education and eliminating poverty, it would be to offer all girls and women the opportunity to decide when and whether and with whom they want to have a child. So then your question is so good. So why is this so hard? Mm. And um, it's so hard because it's so intimate. It's so hard because family members and leaders in societies have, feel they have a lot of say in what happens in that regard, not just the woman. And as Americans, as the point you make, Tilling, it is so deeply influenced by American politics at this moment because of the outsized role that the US plays in the world in global health. So this single thing that would be the biggest pivot is sort of like the hardest thing to achieve. And um, I'd like to just tell you three very quick anecdotes about that. Um, at Pathfinder, we've done this work for 60 years in over 20 countries, and we do the work very much on the ground. So um, I'm an American. I'm based in our office here in Washington and in Boston. Uh, and our staff locally in country are all uh, members of that society, members of that community. And um, we've been making some huge advances in Niger uh, in working with young married couples in um, giving them the opportunity to have contraception. And so a few months ago, I was in Niger in a village. My meeting uh, with the local community was blessed by the local imam. Parents, tribal leaders, young couples talked about what a difference it made to have the opportunity to delay childbearing till you were grown up. Uh, this last uh, couple weeks ago, I was in Mozambique, where we do work on behalf of USAID. We provide support in the prisons across Mozambique and the federal prisons, where we recruit, um, we identify, we recruit, we train, and we support peer counselors who work in the prisons to prevent the spread of HIV and tuberculosis and other diseases. And um, you know, it's very groundbreaking work. We also work in Mozambique with sex workers in the cities. So, I think for us as Americans, and it's fitting for this conversation, it is really vital to realize that what happens in our politics here has this enormous effect uh, globally. And it can open up opportunities, or it can risk opportunities, or as you said, it can distort a setting. So we have a pretty big obligation to get it right, and we have a pretty big challenge in that regard. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I always think that, you know, Margaret Cho has this great line um, about gay marriage and the resistance to gay marriage. And she was like, you know, half these Republican legislators wouldn't even know that gay people were getting married if someone hadn't told them. <laughs> and that, that's kind of how I feel about the money that is funding um, rights, healthcare, and resources um, in places where they just, they wouldn't even know if no, someone hadn't told them. Mm. Um, so let's get specific. Francoise, you know, you are such a leader in this space internationally. What is the global gag rule? What is the Mexico, Mexico City policy? Um, and, and what did Dr Donald Trump do? Um, and, and how much money are we actually talking about here? 
Yeah, the global gag rule under Trump is uh, an expanded version of something that's been in place, uh, put in place by every Republican president since Ronald Reagan. Uh, this started actually in 1984 uh, in Mexico City. That's why it's called the Mexico City policy. And the idea was to condition US funding, foreign assistance, by saying to the organizations uh, in, in the countries that were recipients that if they took US government money, they could no longer speak about abortion, refer patients for abortion, provide any information about abortion, or advocate in their own country if there was a political discussion about you know, whether or not the law should be liberalized. And under Reagan and George W. Bush, it was attached to family planning funds, which is about $500 million of funding a year. Uh, and what it did was extremely damaging because it, it was documented under George W. Bush that it actually led to a decrease in access to contraception in the countries that were affected and an increase in unsafe abortions. <laughs> so a very perverse effect because, of course, when you start attaching conditions like that to funding that goes to reproductive health organizations, a lot of reproductive health organizations are going to say no and walk away from that funding. And we're talking, you know, in that case, $500 million of funding that leaves uh, and the organizations that have been providing comprehensive care, you know, safe abortion care and so on. So that is, of course, damaging to women's health, ultimately, and results in, in worse health outcomes. So Trump, of course, you know, had to do it bigger. So he expanded it from 500 million of family planning funds to $9 billion of global health assistance. So that's what is now deployed in countries such as South Africa, but Nigeria, you know, Pakistan, and elsewhere to actually prevent the best you know, reproductive health organizations from offering comprehensive health care to women. And this is often in settings where there is only one clinic in the community where women have to walk kilometers or miles you know, to access the care, where they need one-stop shop you know, for maternity care, for HIV testing, for abortion, for contraception, for immunization, et cetera. Right? And that's what, under the previous administration, the Obama administration had been put in place. A lot of money was put into helping health systems integrate at the community level so that women would find all their needs met in one clinic. And now we're basically walking back from that, suddenly saying, you know, you know within the span of a year, sorry, n none of that anymore. You need to take abortion out of there. And of course, it's unconscionable because the clinics themselves know that if they stop providing referrals and information about abortion, the, the, the women are, have, are gonna turn to quacks. And they're going to show up once again in the emergency rooms with sticks up their cervix and you know uncontrollable bleeding and septic uh, conditions. It's, we're already seeing it in Kenya, where the International Women's Health Coalition works with an organization, the Kisumu Medical Education Trust, that runs 122 clinics in Western Kenya, where these clinics are often the only health provider. They had, because of their comprehensive care over the last eight years, they'd seen almost no emergency room admissions anymore from unsafe abortions, and now it's back on the upswing. And we already see that because we're doing research in real time to see what the impact is. So that's what Trump has done, and it, it is really appalling that this is being done with US tax dollars in our name. Yeah. And uh, he also did that in the first 10 days. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. the first uh, 72 hours. Yeah. yeah, it was one of the first, yeah, things, one of the he first things he did. And with Mike Pence looking eagerly over and the him. Are on yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, that photo it reveals everything you need to know about this policy. Yeah. So, a statistic from the Pathfinder website, just to mm -hmm. further quantify how many people we're talking about. In developing countries, more than half of all women of reproductive age want to avoid pregnancy. 214 million women are not using an effective method of contraception, and millions of women lack the services they need, leading to 74 million unintended pregnancies in developing countries each year. Uh, Lois, talk a little bit about the work that Pathfinder has done in this yeah, space, yeah. and how the Global Gag is impacting your work yeah. now. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a really powerful thing uh, as to be uh, sitting with a young woman uh, who's 15, 16 years old and expecting her first child. And uh, when I was in Mozambique, I, um, half of the women in Mozambique have a child or are expecting by the time they're 18. And so their ability to be able to not only, um, you know, fulfill their own potential in life, but to care for their children and to be the kind of positive dynamic force in what's a very exciting country, Mozambique, 
is really limited because that first child at that age is followed quite quickly by other children. So there's an element of this that is really practical. Um, we provide, uh, we work at providing clinics in high schools. Um, we train high school students to be peer educators. Um, we, we use a peer educator model most places we work to have, um, that's much more effective than having a medical professional. We work, we work at, with the, whoever the leaders are in a setting, whether it's a high school principal or a religious leader or a traditional leader to create the platform. And then we have peer educators work with young people to um, you know, really provide options. And there is so much more of this work that needs to be done. And the, the tragedy of the gag rule, and I think it's something that maybe a lot of Americans don't understand, is I think we feel, you know, I, I as a Minnesotan feel like, you know, I want my doctor to be able to tell me all the treatment options that are available mm -hmm. to me so that I can make a choice on my own or make a choice in content, consultation with my doctor. And the gag rule does not allow local clinics to do that if they receive funds from the United States. Uh, and so exactly as Francois said, we see people who suffer the implications of that. And it's very painful for them, their children, and their families. Now, you know, to, to, to your point, what's been sort of a dynamic in this period in the United States politics is this administration, when they put the family planning budget in this year, um, in the first year, it was zero. They eliminated all family planning. This Congress reinstated the entire amount of family planning. A Republican Congress reinstated um, uh, over $500 million. And then in the most recent budget, they cut the money in half, but I believe this Congress will reinstate that. So there's a kind of coalition here in the United States for doing this work, and that is what we need to here build on. Mm -hmm. Because quite literally, people's lives depend on it, and the well-being, our ability to confront the challenges that we have in the world today requires the input of women. And women cannot provide that input um, if they are weighted down by the inability to have any influence in terms of the number of children that they have. Yeah. Um, so we're all talking from you know this global um, and U.S. dominant perspective. Um, Fla Leng, mm. which I hear also you go by Dr. T. <laughs> 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 Rumor has it. Um, you you have some um, very complex thoughts on this um, that I would love for you to speak to in terms of first of all you know how is the it, it, like enormous amount of funding that comes from the U.S. How does that impact what the work you're doing? Um, and, and, and how do you, you know, how do you kind of navigate that? Okay, so what the, and I'm a private practitioner, so if you're looking just on the surface, I should be okay because I'm working private. But the way that the health system is set up in South Africa is that even the National Department of Health depends on civil society organizations as implementers of their health programs. And a lot of those NGOs are also partners with USAID. And therefore, I limited in terms of who I can partner with in civil society. It means I will remain a lone voice in terms of being a medic who's in a formally organized um, civil society organization. And that already limits our ability to advocate and hold the powers that be to account. Because in South Africa, not only is our right to reproductive health guaranteed by the Constitution, but we have a specific act that um, gives the right to termination of pregnancy. And it is one of the most liberal in the world because it just says a person who is pregnant who wants to not be pregnant anymore. It doesn't even give you an age. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a reason up to 12 weeks. Um, and yet, even with that, at the moment, unsafe abortions happening outside of a medical facility outnumber safe abortions two to one. Um, we have, at the moment, um, women who are still having uh, sepsis, hemorrhaging, a lot of young people having hysterectomies because of complications. Often we speak about the deaths, but we miss a big chunk of women who then have these lifelong um, comorbidities as a result of unsafe procedures. And it means that medical students, for example, in South Africa, 
don't have a, a, a line item in their logbooks for competency. So a lot of them, what they're doing is they are learning about terminations in theory, but they can opt out in practice. So even if you can say, well, the health system is great, the doctors are there, the nurses are there, often there's no stock mm. because it means that, um, you know, our medicines council is very slow in registering generics. So if you're still buying medication at very high prices, even for those who are in private, they still can not afford. It's also becoming um, inaccessible for them as well. And then the other issue, of course, um, in terms of directly, you know, with that global gag, is that you know when you separating people, you are sort of deciding which parts of themselves are more important, mm. and you are denying people the dignity of making informed decisions about their lives, and a right to dignity, something that should push all of us, and hence even medical professionals who what is honourable and really impede and, and and have obstacles to for women to not access abortions are really dishonorable. You know, they shouldn't be anywhere where a health professional can say, well, because of my own culture or religion, I don't do this. I mean, you went to medical school voluntarily. No one forced you to do medicine. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you don't have a right to choose which parts of women you treat. But then people hide behind the global gag and say, well, mm -hmm. we, we have a big HIV program here, and we mm -hmm. can't risk that. And I often say, but the same woman who's HIV positive Often, they are not even told about the drug interactions with their oral tablets. They will fall pregnant. Um, and then people further stigmatize them that you are HIV positive, you just did ARVs, why are you even having sex? But sexual pleasure is a human right. Who's allowed to have sex and who isn't allowed to have sex, you know? And then when they come back to, require, to request their abortion, there are no medical protocols in all of the eight um, provinces in South Africa. 23 years later, even with that act, only the Western Cape has a medical protocol for how doctors and nurses should be able to provide services. So a lot of this, um, the laws really don't translate into access for women, and that's where the biggest injustice is. I mean, the issue of safety and security, a lot of women are victims of gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, and the issue of pregnancy, for whatever reason, in the stage of their relationship, sometimes it's in leaving, sometimes it's in wanting a second chance, you know, um, at life. And you, you are not offering that for a person. And what about, you know, um, their right to then also, um, you know, access, safety, medical care, and dignity, their bodily integrity. So all of this is really hinged on human rights. I mean, there's absolutely no place in abortion for, um, you know, cultural religion. Just like when men go for um, the erectile treatment, no one brings the issue of morality there, you know? <laughs> when people, um, you know, I've, <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was on a radio, I did a radio interview just last week before coming here, precisely on the global gag, you know, and of course there were four male callers who were lined up for the call, predictably so. And all of them are talking about this is so bad, this is so bad, this is so bad, life begins, you know, um, at, uh, at conception. And I'm saying, but when you're having a wet dream and you're ejaculating, what are you, is that not DNA? So perhaps all of you then should, you should start being charged for that, you know? Because clearly then all genetic material should translate into humans. Um, so because, you know, and then that's really what it boils down to. Because I have genetic material in my uterus and I don't want it there anymore. So, you know, I must be dead or be denied mm -hmm. care just because of that. Um, and I think we always, I always go back to the issue of human rights, that this is a human right to be able to decide what happens to, you, to your yeah. body. And when a patient is standing in front of me, I can't be worried about a hypothetical future mm. person. I'm worried about this one who's standing in front of me now, who's saying, I need care, can you help me? Um, so I, this phrase, I've never heard this before, Sexual pleasure as a human right. Mm -hmm. um, and and I know you you know you recently wrote an op-ed about having to go beyond legal reform. But can you talk a little bit more more about that? Like what do you, what do you mean by that? What you know that the idea of sexual pleasure should be a human right. All right. So when I mean again, it's also because of the HIV response. Everything became so biomedical. If we just get the vaccine, if we just get the mm. ARVs and do all of that. Mm. But the health messaging around that, especially for African girls, was just keep your legs closed, mm -hmm. just stay in school, stay away from boys, and just say no. And it did nothing to help us with the fact that young girls also get aroused, they also get horny, they need to know about masturbation, they need to know when they finally decide to have sex, what are the safety sex tools? So when we say that the, the laws must be translatable, it means that women who are having sex with women have to have access to dental dams. You see? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the fact that um, 
if I do, I do decide that I want to have sex as a young black girl, I can't be burdened with vaginal virginity so I can keep my family name okay. Because guess what? The girls are having anal sex to preserve vaginal virginity. And you know that anal sex has the highest risk of HIV transmission. And then people are wondering, why are these programs not working? They are not working because we're denying the fact that people are going to have sex. It actually feels nice. But in the context of all these STIs and unsupportable pregnancies, how do we help you? So we try, you know, people all the time, it happens with all the campaigns. Like, no, no, telling, hold on, you, you, can't, you can't talk like that. I'm like, but that's the honest truth. That's what young people want to know in consultations, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and therefore, if you're still denying the fact that people have sex for pleasure, you're still going to focus on the wrong thing. Because you're not going to, you, you, even the, 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 the comprehensive sexual education in schools happening right now. There's a lot of infiltration by American NGOs, yes. faith-based NGOs, mm -hmm. that are preaching, play, that are making children sign pledges and all of that. Further fuels, um, you know, that abstinence only thing. So it doesn't help to have all these laws. Who is implementing that? Because having an NGO in a school preaching abstinence, that's not how you translate services. In Eastern Cape right now in South Africa, you have nurses who are giving counseling to women on a range of things with two other people from other faith-based organizations in the room. I've never seen that with heart transplant patients. I've never seen that in <laughs> neurosurgery. I've never seen it anyway. But yet in clinics where young women go to, and often it's the only safer space they have in the communities, mm -hmm. they then have to climb out of these other uh, problems. So as a 13-year-old girl, for example, you go to a clinic for contraception, you get shouted at, why are you even thinking about mm -hmm. sex? So it means you're already a whore, right? Then you leave without the contraception. You fall pregnant. You come back. Why are you pregnant? <clears throat> Do you not know about contraceptives? What's wrong with you, young people? Mm. Then your clinic is probably receiving you SAID funds. No one refers you anyway. No one gives you information. So you end up in the unsafe and outside of medical health facility. So it's a vicious cycle. And no matter where you look, you, there is just no break for, for young women. We literally can't breathe because everywhere you go, um, everyone is trying to control what you do. Um, I can relate to this in that to one of the most popular pieces that we ran at Teen Vogue last year was a guide to anal sex. And it, I get at least two to three emails. Actually, when I, was a, when I became executive editor, several people, they were like, oh, we're so glad to see an Indian there because now you're going to turn the, like, you're going to stop letting them write about that. And I was like, oh. obviously you didn't Google me. <laughs> um, but, you know, producing this information because young people are going to look it up anyway. Yes. It doesn't matter. Like whether we decide they should or shouldn't have whatever kinds of sex they should or shouldn't have, they're going to do it. If anything, they're going to do it, especially because you told them not to do it. So yeah. <laughs> that's that's something that we have definitely um, included in our coverage um, at, at, you know, in a teen magazine and, and have come under quite a bit of criticism for it. Um, so, you know, on that note, I think that um, all of us have kind of worked in the space for a long time, and it's come with consequences, right? Mm -hmm. There's um, both online harassment, offline harassment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was sharing an anecdote earlier. We had our Teen Vogue Summit a couple of weeks ago, and Cecile Richards was one of the keynote speakers, and we're walking her to her car, and there's a bunch of activists there, anti-abortion activists, and they're we were like, they're not activists. Like, they're what? They're haters. They're not activists. They're not. Yeah, they're haters. That is true. Trolls. Living trolls, um, they left their <laughs> they left their mom's basement for the day, um, <laughs> made it out. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I mean, to be obsessed on that level, yeah. to, you know, yeah. she she came to give a fifteen minute talk, like the, one of many people that was speaking. Um, what have been the consequences mm. for all of you for being outspoken, mm. for your teams for being outspoken, and how do you grapple with that? Yeah, it takes its toll. I mean, obviously, you know, we are uh, periodically we're attacked in live news. Uh, if you ever, you know, want to see what they're saying, uh, you can go on live news and periodically they attack the International Women's Health Coalition there, which uh, we take as an indicator of our success, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but it, it is sometimes a little scary. And in particular, it's it's scary for our partners, the feminist groups that we support in, in Africa, Latin America, Asia and the Middle East, they, they do face real consequences uh, in, in those places. And one of our partners in Brazil, of all places, uh, had to move recently because uh, the, you know she's involved with the case that is before the Supreme Court of Brazil right now to decriminalize abortion. And there are going to be hearings in, in August. And so the pressure you know, is ramped up 
on, on the feminist activists, and she had people camping outside her home every day uh, for two weeks, and they were very threatening, so she's had to move uh, from her home that, where she lived for 15 years. But you know, it's this kind of thing where you know, they, they are relentless and quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, it's, gosh, it makes me sad because I think, you know, the, the issue of anti-choice, unfortunately, despite the good laws, has really become systemic in South Africa. Mm. Um, and you find that health workers are experiencing a lot of stigma and burnout only because of the a huge number of people that they have to assist mm -hmm. and beyond having to fight for reproductive commodities like gloves and sterilizing units. Um, a lot of, I mean, there's a, a clinic that was moved from the front of the clinic to where the old mortuary was and that was now the new abortion clinic. That's a form of violence mm. for me. And that's something that's affecting providers and people mm. who are seeking terminations. Um, and you know, the other thing, of course, is the internet troll. So whenever there's any talk about abortion, you know, you know, I always get that backlash and, and I troll back in memes and gifts and things mm -hmm. like that. And people get upset that they don't upset mm -hmm. you. It's the most beautiful mm -hmm. thing to watch. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and so, but you learn to sort of do that. But I think it's really good to have um, spaces and, and allies that you can talk to, people that, are, that get you and understand. You know, it's, it's one thing to be constantly fighting the outside world mm -hmm. to understand issues. We need our cups filled. We need to mm -hmm. take you know, time to just process what's happening because it's a lot and it's violent. It really, really is a form of violence. Yeah. And it makes me sad because I feel like my country, my Department of Health is an enabler of violence mm -hmm. because they themselves are allowing all of this to carry on. I mean, I was told that you know, uh, people who obstruct women can't be disciplined because you know, there aren't enough doctors and nurses anyway already, so mm -hmm. you know, we can't, I mean, really, the health system will collapse. So if anyone is always demanded to give, listen, wait, mm. be patient, it's always women, you know. Um, and often those who can afford mm. alternatives, mm. those who, I mean, a lot of women have to travel about 200 kilometers, which is about two hours, um, from one province or one city to get services, you know. Jobs, a lot of black women are still doing very low paid jobs mm. that if you take two mm. days of work, you, you're out of work, mm. you know? So when you're talking about adherence, come back for a follow-up. When can I, I can't come back for a follow-up. Mm. You know, that's why protocols are needed because people need to know how to help women timelessly without delay. And everything is evidence-based. I mean, now we know even with Trump, they removed words like transgender, evidence, science, <laughs> abortion, <laughs> reproductive rights <laughs> from the CDC text, right? Yeah. Yeah. And all of that, filters down to the, un to the United Nations, the Commission on Population Development, the status of women. It, it, all of it infiltrates, and therefore we can't allow, and I think that's why for me, it's, if civil society is galvanized, and we support those people who are speaking out, it's fine, give me high fives, but I need money to do this work, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's what we need. We need a, a, an effort. And you need to understand that people who are hateful, and Trump and all of them, they are funded that hate. You know, so we can also be obsessed with coming across as nice and moderate and well considered in the face of all of this. Um, and therefore, I think that that's sort of, yeah, so there's, there's real sort of, you know, stuff that's happening, but a lot of the violence is systemic. Mm -hmm. And to undo yeah. all of that is going to take a lot of work, long term work. So we need funding that can last. Don't give me a funding for a year. I can't do anything, you know, for a year mm -hmm. and not know what's coming after two years or three years. And that, that's, the, that's the biggest thing, I think, for all of us. And let's elect leadership that l looks like what we think we are. <laughs> because it's one thing to elect Trump and then say, but we don't like what he did. Then who elected him? You know? Because if I was in South Africa knowing he's a train smash happening, you guys had to have known that too, but you still <laughs> voted for him. So, you know, and accountability works we both it. ways. You know, it works. <laughs> no, we've had our Trump e rights passed yeah. now. <laughs> um, but the, the, and I think that's you know we have to be honest about the issues of white supremacy and how population control, even in Africa, is still linked to the types of contraception that women are being um, given at the moment. We obviously then have to talk about the paternalistic ways in which medicine. Yeah. still pra is practiced onto people, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're doing research, for example, a lot of it is being done on black bodies. Cells extracted, data is extracted, PhDs are conferred in the global north, and nothing ever trickles back down, except we must now buy the new medical research in dollars. And in my case in South Africa, mm -hmm. we had to take the government to court to give us the stuff in mm -hmm. dollars, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a whole 
chain of accountability, but a, a working together that we need to have and realize that truly, truly there are no borders. We can try as much as we can mm -hmm. to pretend like there's these states and we're perfect and you all don't come here. And at the end of the day, the world is set up that what happens in Africa, what happens in here, it, we are all connected mm -hmm. and we need to remember that, um, that the fight is for all of us. It's not just for poor women. Um, they don't need saving. Let's understand why it keeps them poor and let's work at, at those issues because we, then we just start at, you know, having recipients of aid, but why do people need aid in the first place? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, yes. um, I wanna build on your point because it, in the end it's about justice. It is about justice and equality and the ability for every person to be who they are and achieve what they can have in life and there are a lot of barriers to that. Courage is one of our values, and um, our staff at Pathfinder have uh, had um, you know, attacks, whether it's by individuals or more state-sponsored uh, secret police visits and all that throughout our whole history. So it's part of, part of what we do and what we work is we prevail through that. And our staff recognize that, and they recognize that they're doing something, work of historic importance, and this is part of what they do. Uh, for myself, being, being here in this country, it's, it's, it's easier. Um, I would say my whole adult life I've been attacked by uh, people who disagree with my support for reproductive justice and rights. And I think what's different now is the online opportunity to do that leads to a kind of viciousness, the mm -hmm. trolling and the, because um, people can do it in a kind of anonymous way. Yeah. Yeah. And then super disturbing, there is an edge of violence to it that I didn't see before that is, I think, mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. There's, so what can you do um, 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 supporting this work and supporting the individuals who do it and recognizing and appreciating is, is one of the biggest um, antidotes to an individual who has to deal with this. Is, rec is to being able to also know that there are people out there who really appreciate that they're enduring despite a lot of personal cost. Can I say something about the role of the US in all of this? Because until recently, for example, we work with activists in Egypt right. where, as you know, the Egyptian state has taken the turn for, for the even worse, uh, if possible. Uh, and they're now attacking civil society organizations working on human rights, women's rights, a range of issues, right? Uh, and this, is, this has happened with a lot of populist governments around the world, and, and, you know, and it's referred to as the closing of mm. civil society space, but I don't like that formula because it's not a closing that just happens like a natural phenomenon. This is actually governments cracking mm -hmm. down on independent mm -hmm. civil society and the press quite often at the same time. And uh, one of our partners in Egypt is this fabulous uh, feminist lawyer who's been fighting for women's rights and reproductive rights for years, mm. uh, including the rights of women to retain custody of their children after mm. a divorce, and you know all these mm. very difficult questions mm. in Egypt. And um, a year and a half ago, she was arrested because she was uh, a little critical of the government, but nothing more than you know the usual. Mm. She's pretty fierce. And uh, they seized her passport and freezed her bank accounts, and now she can't leave mm -hmm. Egypt. Mm -hmm. And in the past, when uh, the government did things like that, um, we were able to call on the Obama administration mm -hmm. and the US ambassador in Egypt to intervene mm -hmm. and, and you know, weigh in with the Egyptian government to help, and now we, we can't mm -hmm. turn to our government mm -hmm. to help at all. I mean, it, this is the most disconcerting thing, I have to say, you know. I'm myself an immigrant to this country, mm -hmm. and we, we can't turn to the U.S. government to defend human rights defenders, reproductive rights defenders, feminist activists in the countries where we work. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's an incredible mm -hmm. loss. And it's tough for people like myself, because mm -hmm. I work with Francois. Um, we was, my mm -hmm. coalition in South Africa um, is supported um, by the IWHC. And what we find is that those relationships become extraordinarily more difficult. It means the work gets slowed down even more. Um, and the desperation is really for you to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and we're not talking about, you know, data is good, but sometimes you get stuck in the numbers. But you can imagine as a medical practitioner certifying a dead body of a 16-year-old, you know, 
Um, you can do that a couple of times, but it really gets to you. And it's not that it's the abortion itself, but it's everything else around that, you know? The fact that people feel their pregnancies are unsupportable in the first place, those are the things we need to be asking questions about, you know? Um, and, and not just be obsessive about this medical, well-researched mm. procedure that's safer than childbirth mm. or a gastroscope, actually. Mm. So, you know, and we are so obsessive about it. And I think the, 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 the positivity for me at the moment is it lies in the coalitions and the, you know, I mean, we had the Senate so last month um, together, you know, to hold a briefing about what does the global gap look like? Because for the first time with IWHC support, we are able to do research and find out right now what the impact is. Whereas with the Bush administration, the chilling effect of the silencing of the gag really worked because we didn't mm -hmm. have data. We stopped collecting mm -hmm. information about mm -hmm. specific septic miscarriages mm -hmm. or abortions. Mm -hmm. You know, they still don't like to use the word abortion. And so we can't even prove. So when I say, like, you know, there's been no services, the next thing someone says, what are the numbers? Well, there are no numbers. That's what mm -hmm. the gag does. Mm -hmm. If you can't quantify it, you can't plan for it and you can't mm -hmm. budget for it. Um, and so that's the difficulty that we have, is that we need to look at all the problems all at the same time. Yeah. But feminist organizing has been a lifesaver. Like that solidarity across countries is yeah. you know, yeah. what keeps us <laughs> going. Yeah. Yeah. And, and periodically we need to get together, close the doors and say, okay, you yeah. know, <laughs> what are we gonna do? What's yeah. going on here? Because it, it's fierce out there, yeah. it, it's fierce. Absolutely. So, Ladies, thank you so much for your work and for this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. And there's a mic also. I'm Allison Yara, I'm a journalist. My question is, this is such a powerful, just voice, hearing all of your voices is so powerful. This is a room that's mostly full, filled with women. Uh -huh. How do we sort of, how have you seen in your work and on the ground sort of messaging that brings in men into this conversation? Because just because this is about our bodies and sort of, you know, pregnancy is seen to be a, a, a woman's responsibility wholly, but how do we sort of get this to be something that men are fighting on the front lines for too? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for that question. Um, we're just uh, running a Father's Day campaign to highlight the role that fathers can play in supporting their daughters to get access to contraception and finish school and delay um, uh, marriage and, and childbearing. And um, in that, we're profiling uh, fathers around the world who played this kind of role. Um, we work with um, husbands. We, we operate husband schools in many of the places where we work to um, teach husbands about what it means uh, to, uh, for a woman to be pregnant, um, to bring husbands into the picture in an effective way. Of course, in most of the places we work, most of the leaders are men as well. Most of the traditional leaders, um, uh, religious leaders and government leaders are men. And we work, um, we work with them. Uh, so our work is about, um, you know, so much at the heart of what it means to be a woman. Uh, and we seek to create this environment um, around women that can be supportive of that. Can That's often hard. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah. the thing is, men are involved, right? But they're involved in obstructing women getting services. <laughs> they're involved in drawing up policy that doesn't make sense, and they're ignoring the evidence. Mm -hmm. Politics is trumping medicine, literally. So men are involved, and I am one of those who don't have any issues where men are nowhere near my uterus. I have more than enough capabilities between me and my doctor to make the right decision. What we need them to know is grow up as boys and young men who understand consent, that you don't have a right to determine what other people's bodies do, and when they have made that decision, you are going to respect it. Because a lot of women have been taught, young girls, mm -hmm. say no, say no, it's fine. But no one is telling the young men, respect mm, the no, because good. then they're getting yeah. beaten up for saying no, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're having silent orgasms because now, how, where do you know how to have sex? How do you know it feels good? 
people are being beaten up for that, right? Mm -hmm. So men are involved, but it's how they are involved and the, and the attitudes mm -hmm. they're bringing into the space. So we need to go back to basics. You know, the ease of patriarchy, if we're not gonna name the things and say what it is, you know, it's not that they are just don't care. They know very well, mm -hmm. but it's when they can't exert their force on you that then they start, you know, uh, having problems. But the minute, you know, everyone is sub subservient and yes, 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 mm -hmm. then they are fine with it. They are happy. The, I mean, look at the world now, right? Women are saying no, and suddenly the men are, are losing their, you know, um, <laughs> their marbles. But the point is, we need to, we need to, to, to understand that there are spaces where we need men, but there are spaces where we, they, you know, men don't sit and ask, we need Viagra. What do the women think? <laughs> yeah. You know, then they get on and do things. And even as women, we need to stop feeling like we need to bring men with us. Anyway, there, there are places where we can do all of this on our own. What we don't need is obstructions. Um, and, and unfortunately, they fund. Patriarchy funds itself, right? Um, it's a machine. It's a system of oppression. And so we need to work at raising young men who respect autonomy. And if, I, if I'm a boy, I don't want an abortion. I mustn't have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Everything.